Caution 3. Whosoever expects the benefit of the following prescriptions and rules must not think the reading or bare remembering of them will do the work, but he must work them into his heart by believing and fixed meditation and live in the daily practice of them. It is not our opening of our case to a physician, nor his prescriptions and written directions that will cure a man, but he must resolve to take the bitter and nauseous potion, how much soever he loathe it, to abstain from hurtful diet, how well soever he loves it, if ever he expect to be a sound and healthful man. So it is in this case also. These things premised the rules. Rule number one. The first rule to relieve us against our slavish fears is seriously to consider and more thoroughly to study the covenant of grace within the blessed clasp and bond whereof all believers are. I think the clear understanding of the nature, extent, and stability of the covenant and of our interest therein would go a great way in the cure of our sinful and slavish fears. A covenant is more than a naked promise. In the covenant, God has graciously consulted our weakness, fears, and doubts, and therefore proceeds with us in the highest way of solemnity, confirming his promises by oath and by his seals, putting himself under the most solemn ties and engagements that can be to his people, that from so firm a ratification of the covenant with us we might have strong consolation. He has so ordered it that it might afford strong supports and the most reviving cordials to our faint and timorous spirits in all the plunges of trouble, both from within and from without. In the covenant, God makes over himself to his people to be unto them a God wherein the Lord bestows himself in all his glorious essential properties upon us, to the end that whatsoever his almighty power, infinite wisdom, and incomprehensible mercy can afford for our protection, support, deliverance, direction, pardon, or refreshment, we might be assured shall be faithfully performed to us in all the straits, fears, and exigencies of our lives. This God expects we should improve by faith as the most sovereign antidote against all our fears in this world. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And if thou, reader, be within the bonds of the covenant, thou mayest surely find enough there to quiet thy heart, whatever the matter or ground of thy fears be. If God be thy covenant to God, he will be with thee in all thy straits, wants, and troubles. He will never leave nor forsake thee. From the covenant it was that David encouraged himself against all his troubles. In Second Samuel 23.5 Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant, well ordered in all things, and sure. This is all my salvation, and all my desire, though he make it not to grow. He could fetch all reliefs, all comforts, and salvation out of it, and why cannot we? 
He desired no more for the support of his heart. This is all my desire. And sure, if we understood and believed it as he did, we could desire no more to quiet and comfort our hearts than what this covenant affords us. For are we afraid what our enemies will do? We know we are in the midst of potent, politic, and enraged enemies. We have heard what they have done, and see what they are preparing to do again. We tremble to think what bloody tragedies are like to be acted over again in the world by their cruel hands. But oh, what heroic and noble acts of faith should a covenant of God enable thee to exert amidst all these fears? If God be thy God, then thou hast an almighty God on thy side, and that is enough to extinguish all these fears. Psalm 118, 6 The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. Your fears come in the name of man, but your help in the name of the Lord. Let them plot, threaten, yea, and smite too. God is a shield to all that fear him, and if God be for us, who can be against us? Or are we afraid what God will do? Fear it not, your God will do nothing against your good. Think not that he may forget you, it cannot be. Sooner may a tender mother forget her suckling child. No, he withdraweth not his eye from the righteous. His eyes are continually upon all the dangers and wants of your souls and bodies. There is not a danger or an enemy stirring against you, but his eye is upon it. Are you afraid he will forsake and cast you off? It is true. Your sins have deserved he should do so. But he hath secured you fully against that fear in his covenant. Jeremiah thirty two forty. I will not turn away from them to do them good. All your fears of God's forgetting or forsaking you spring out of your ignorance of the covenant. Or... Are you afraid what you shall do? It is usual for the people of God to propose difficult cases to themselves and put startling questions to their own hearts, and there may be an excellent use of them to rouse them out of security, put them upon the search and trial of their conditions in the States, and make preparation for the worst. But Satan usually improves it to quite a contrary end, to deject, affright, and discourage them. Oh, if fiery trials should come, if my liberty and life come once to be touched in earnest, I fear I shall never have strength to go on a step farther in the way of religion. I am afraid I shall faint in the first encounter. I shall deny the words of the Holy One, make shipwreck of faith and a good conscience in the first gust of temptation. I can hear and pray and profess, but I doubt I cannot burn or bleed or lie in a dungeon for Christ. If I can scarce run with footmen in the land of peace, how do I think to contend with horses in these swellings of Jordan? But yet... All these are but groundless fears, either forged in thy own misgiving heart, or secretly shuffled by Satan into it. For God hath abundantly secured thee against fear in this very particular, by that most sweet, supporting, and blessed promise, annexed to the former in the same text, Jeremiah thirty two forty. I will put my fear into their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Here is another kind of fear than that which so startles thee, promise to be put into thy heart, not to fear to shake and undermine thy assurance, as this doth, but to guard and maintain it. 
and this is the fear that shall be enabled to vanquish and expel all thy other fears. Or are you afraid what the church shall do, and what will become of the ark of God? Do you see a storm gathering, winds begin to roar, the waves to swell? And are you afraid what will become of that vessel, the church, in which you have so great an interest? It is an argument of the publicness and excellency of thy spirit to be thus touched with the feeling sense of the church's sufferings and dangers. Most men seek their own things and not the things that are Christ's. But yet, it is your sin so to fear as to sink and faint under a spirit of despondency and discouragement, which yet many good men are but too apt to do. I remember an excellent passage in a letter of Luther's to Melanchthon upon this very account. In private troubles, saith he, I am weaker, and thou art stronger. Thou despisest thy own life, but fearest the public cause. But for the public, I am at rest, being assured that the cause is just and true, yea, that it is Christ and God's cause. I am well nigh a secure spectator of things, and esteem not anything these fierce and threatening papists can do. I beseech thee by Christ, neglect not so divine promises and consolations, where the scripture saith, Pass thy care upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, be strong, and he shall comfort thy heart. And in another epistle, I much dislike those anxious cares which, as thou writes, do almost consume thee. It is not the greatness of the danger, but the greatness of thy unbelief. John Huss and others were under greater danger than we, and if it be great, he is great that orders it. Why do you afflict yourself? If the cause be bad, let us renounce it. If it be good, why do we make him a liar who bids us be still? As if you were able to do any good by such unprofitable cares. I beseech thee, thou, that in other things art valiant. Fight against thyself, thine own greatest enemy, that puts weapons into Satan's hand. You see how good men may be even overwhelmed with public fears, but certainly, if we did well consider the bond of the covenant that is between God and his people, we should be more quiet and composed. For by reason thereof it is, one, that God is in the midst of them, as in Psalm 46, when any great danger threatened the Reformed Church in its tender beginning, in Luther's time, he would say, Come, let us sing the 46th Psalm. And indeed, it is a lovely song for such times. It bears the title of A Song Upon Alamoth, or A Song for the Hidden Ones. God is with them to cover them under his wings. Two, and it is plain matter of fact, evident to all the world, that no people under the heavens have been so long and so wonderfully preserved as the church hath been. It hath overlived many bloody massacres, terrible persecutions, subtle and cruel enemies. Still, God hath preserved and delivered it, for his promises obliged him to do it. Amongst which those two are signal and eminent ones, Jeremiah thirty eleven and Isaiah twenty seven three. And it is obvious to all that will consider things, that there are the self same motives in God, and the self same grounds and reasons before Him, to take care of His church and people that ever were in Him or did ever lie before Him from the beginning of the world, for the relation is still the same. 
What though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those renowned believers, be in their graves, and those that succeed be far inferior to them in grace and spiritual excellency? Yet saith the church, Doubtless thou art our father. There is the same tie and bond between the father and the youngest, weakest child in the family as the eldest and strongest. His pity and mercy is still the same, for that endures forever. His bowels yearn as tenderly over his people in their present as ever they did in any past afflictions or straits. The rage and malice of his and his people's enemies is still the same. They will reflect as blasphemously and dishonorably upon God now, should he give up his people, as ever they did. Moses' argument is as good now as ever it was. What will the Egyptians say? And so is Joshua's too. What wilt thou do unto thy great name? Oh, if these things were more thoroughly studied and believed, they would appease many fears.